This video is brought to you by Sportsman's Guide, your one-stop shop for all your outdoor needs. Check them out at www.sportsmansguide.com. Hello, my friends, and welcome to a new episode here at Ordnance Lab. I'm Jake, the mad scientist, and what we have here is Brian, not Cody. Cody's obviously couldn't come to this video because he's busy doing something with his wife, or he, you know, people still get married amazingly. <laughs> I could have never do it. A good friend of ours, Andy, a long time ago, suggested that we experiment with thermobaric uh, de uh, explosives. And we didn't really think of it much at first, but, you know, Brian came up with a really clever idea. We put two and two together and, well, came up Here with we a, are today. Uh, where'd you get the idea from? Well, I was reading some uh, historical documentation on some old Russian weapons uh, from the 50s and 60s. And thermobarics uh, were, were uh, commonly referenced, so I started researching that a little bit more. and. Well, one thing led to another, and we got some ideas to play with. <laughs> oh, yes, we did. So we have several for you in, uh, in ascending order of magnitude. So you're going to see that this is not quite like a normal explosion, and you'll see in the video. So um, we'll cut away to a quick explanation of what thermobarics are, and then we'll get this thing going. So some of you are probably wondering, what the heck are thermobaric devices? And they go under different titles that you may have heard before, such as fuel air bombs or vapor bombs. Many different titles to basically the same device. So let's start with the basics, thermobarics, and where does that title come from? Well, as many of you might know, the English language is a hodgepodge of many different languages, especially Latin and Greek. And thermobarics comes from the Greek side. Yes, the Greeks, the people who have given us delicious euros, the overdramatized story of the 300, the Spartans, which unfortunately a certain demographic in the United States has overpiratized to use for their Molon Labe title. Ugh, so much cringe. And also a meltdown economy that has completely ruined the EU. Ouch. Anyways, thermobarics can be broken down into its core Greek words. Thermo being heat and barracks being pressure. You put them together and you get thermobarics. But that doesn't really tell us much really because high explosives generate pressure and heat and so do low explosives. So what's so special about thermobarics? Well, that means that we need to go to, uh, uh, what do I think? Ah, yes, a diagram. Let's cut to a diagram and we get a better idea what a thermobaric system is. Here is a nifty yet crude diagram of a thermobaric device. From the exterior view, it looks like any other aerial drop bomb, right? Let's carve it open like a turkey and see the interior denote the difference. There we go, much better. There are several aspects about thermobaric devices that distinguish it from other explosive devices. The main component of the thermobaric device is that it has a dedicated payload of high performance fuel. The fuel is normally in a liquid or solid state. Gaseous state fuels are not ideal as they are not very dense and they lose out a ton on energy density. Liquid fuels such as gasoline or kerosene are sometimes used, often with an additive to increase combustion. For solid fuels, it can be metals such as magnesium or aluminum. In the core of the thermobaric device is a high explosive charge that is carefully balanced to disperse the fuel to an ideal amount and area. Too little of explosive and the fuel will not be spread effectively. Too much explosive and it will be scattered to kingdom come and too lean of a mixture. The dispersion charge may also serve as the ignition source depending on the design of the thermobaric device. The alternative is a coordinated ignition delay charge that ignites the fuel at a very short time after the dispersion charge explodes. This gives the fuel time to achieve an ideal stoichiometric ratio. Inside the explosive charge is the detonator that kicks off the show. It's connected to the fuse assembly of this device. This can be any sort of fuse from impact, time delay, altitude triggered, etc. Now let's look at a thermobaric device in action. Here is a BLU-96 aerial drop fuel air bomb, developed by the US Navy at China Lake, California. Freezing the video here, we can see the bomb dispersion charge exploded and created a neat cloud of fuel adjacent to the target. Shortly after that, the fuel cloud is ignited and begins to form an impressive explosion. Pay close attention here to the pressure wave emerging from the explosion. That pressure wave obliterates the building with ease, turning it into dust. Talk about an impressive sight. So that video is pretty cool and gives you an excellent visualization of what thermobarics can do, but let's get a different visualization of the pressure wave of a thermobaric device in comparison to, say, a high explosive. And to help you visualize what a pressure wave from a thermobaric device is in comparison to a high explosive device, we have this chart made for you. The y-axis is pressure and then the x-axis is time. So first we'll chart out high explosive detonation of say TNT with a detonation velocity of about 7,000 meters a second. The pretty much the industry standard for explosives. So when TNT detonates, it generates this really rapid peak that drops off rather rapidly as well. And this is pretty much pretty typical with high explosives in general. 
But with a thermobaric device, the peak is a whole lot wider over a longer period of time. And this is the signature thing about thermobaric devices. It generates a pressure wave that is not so much continuous, but it's over a larger period of time in comparison to a high explosive device. So we built three thermobaric devices with parts we found around the range, completely improvised. So we're not totally sure if they're gonna work. Hopefully they do, fingers crossed. We had a successful test with one we worked on today. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna try and emulate that. And we made a few tweaks to these devices to hopefully give us some data whether this will provide us with an ultimate final concept of a very effective thermobaric hand grenade. Now, enough talk, let's move on to the range and then test out the first device. Here's our first charge using an aluminum can and contains a solid fuel core of approximately 400 grams. We place it roughly centered to these old targets you might recognize. Roughly one meter from this target and two meters from this target. This gives you a rough scale for reference. The first charge did go off, which is a good sign. When we slow down the camera, we can see the explosion was not ideal, especially for the amount of fuel contained in the grenade. It also left a large pile of molten slag, indicating the fuel wasn't adequately dispersed. This means we need more dispersion explosive in the core. The next charge uses a plastic container and has 500 grams of a solid fuel. Same fuel as before, but we increased the dispersion charge mass. We placed the charge in roughly the same position as the first one to maintain the scale dimensions. The aerial shot shows a much better dispersion of the blast, which is a great sign, a sure indication of progress. This angle also shows a large amount of solid fuel being thrown outward from the main blast, far more than the first one. This is possibly due to the container being plastic instead of metal. Excellent data to note for future tests and designs. Less burning slag was left this time, which means more of the fuel was properly dispersed, exactly what we wanted to see. I would definitely call this progress. Amazingly, the targets are still standing and have not caught on fire after these two blasts. Quite the surprise. Voila, the piece de resistance. The first two were pretty, uh, they were right. Uh, you know, uh, our test one earlier today was, we don't have it on video, but it went very, very well. The first two that you saw, uh, the first one was a little bit eh, and the second one did all right. But obviously let's try it with a little bit uh, bigger charge and a slightly different uh, dispersing charge and uh, ignition. So we have a building back here. We're gonna see how well the thermobaric works against a building. Because thermobarics are really good at that. They're really good at destroying buildings and structures. And what we're gonna do is place this dead center and place the cameras in the same position and see what it does. This is 750 grams of the solid fuel. So this is obviously the biggest of the three. Um, and then we'll go ahead and kick this off and see what happens. So the largest of the three charges performed the best. It launched the building a bit and also caused it to collapse. Not bad. From this camera angle, we can see the thermobaric bomb still was tossing fuel well past the explosive front. You can tell this by the fragments of hot slag being ejected. Overall, the performance was great and gave us excellent data to refine our second wave of thermobaric grenades. Here is the aftermath of the building. The deer stand collapsed and the back end was blown out. A solid demonstration of the pressure wave at work. Well, we wanted a pressure wave and by golly, we got a pressure wave. That last one worked out okay, even though it was still pretty inefficient because you can see some of the fuel getting tossed, but eh, no matter, it worked. The first two were not the greatest and I was not expecting much from them. We were mostly doing these to get a little bit of data so that we can refine them into better thermobaric devices for future videos. Now, these grenades use solid fuel and we're also gonna work on liquid-based fuels and then compare the two and see which one is best. Now, for small grenades, liquid fuels are not the best because you gotta keep them sealed. So we usually, we, we've usually we been sticking with solid fuels with that one. We haven't had great success with liquid fuels. But for larger scale, most definitely liquid fuels. We're going to mix with, uh, try out some different exotic mixtures and see which one is best. Anyways, be sure to like and subscribe. Your likes and comments really help out. The YouTube algorithm, you know, it can be really iffy sometimes. Sometimes the videos, the, they love us, sometimes they hate us. I, I still have yet to figure it out. 
to our Patreons, thank you very much. Well, your money finally got that camera we really wanted, the high-speed Kronos camera. Unfortunately, we just didn't get it in time to film this video, but don't worry, we'll use it for future videos because we really need that data. Slow-mo really helps us out in determining what went wrong and what went right. But anyways, thanks for watching and stay tuned for another episode here at Ordnance Lab. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, be sure to hit the like button, hit subscribe if you want to see more, and stay tuned for another episode here at Ordnance Lab.